This is a Fox News alert. I'm Brett Baer in Washington. We are awaiting the announcement of the grand jury's decision in the Ferguson, Missouri police shooting. It could come any minute, and authorities have warned that it could also spark protests in the St. Louis suburb as well as in urban centers in other parts of the country. At issue, did white police officer Darren Wilson act justifiably when he fatally shot unarmed African-American Michael Brown on August 9th? My colleague Shepard Smith is at the Fox News deck in New York monitoring the situation. Shep. Brett, an, a number of matters at hand tonight. We're expecting to hear 30 minutes from now or so from the Missouri Governor Jay Nixon. Uh, we're not entirely sure what he will be doing, except that we know that he will be urging calm tonight at whatever point this announcement is made. Uh, there will be an announcement that either an indictment has been handed down on a certain number of counts or no indictment at all. And that announcement has, well, the time that it will come is another matter that we have no idea about. There is a lot of word on the side that it may happen around 8 o'clock Eastern time, but we're hoping that when the governor speaks in 30 minutes, he will let us know when that announcement is to be read. The grand jury still sequestered and held until after the announcement is made. It was considering whether the Ferguson police officer, Darren Wilson, should be charged in the death of Michael Brown. So 30 minutes from now, the governor, and then at some point, the reading of the decision, Brett. We'll have it all live here. Shep, thank you. We have Fox team coverage tonight. James Rosen reports that Ferguson investigations will not be over no matter what the grand jury decides tonight. But we begin with correspondent Steve Harrigan at the Justice Center in Clayton, Missouri. Hello, Steve. Brett, small crowds have begun to gather in anticipation of an announcement. This grand jury has largely worked out of the scenes behind closed doors for the past three months. Now they have reached a decision, and in the next couple of hours, we're likely to hear an announcement of that decision. The grand jury of 12, nine whites, three blacks, has a range of options open to them, anything from letting Officer Wilson walk free all the way up to first-degree murder. So a couple of important decisions to be made by that grand jury. Over the past three months since the incident happened, both sides have really been prepared their response, and it's really not clear to anyone how that response could go. A number of stores and businesses in the area have already boarded up, and I can tell you just in the last couple of hours, in anticipation of a coming announcement, more and more stores are closing as the roads also are being blocked off. In recent nights, we've seen very small-scale protests, 50 to 70 demonstrators out there, just a handful of arrests and really not much violence. On the other hand, the law enforcement presence is visible and growing, not only police, but National Guard and also a governor who has made clear that violent unrest will not be tolerated. Brett, back to you. Steve Harrigan, thank you. We'll head back for any breaking news. The Ferguson matter is still far from settled. A federal investigation into the shooting is still going on. Chief Washington correspondent James Rosen has that part of the story tonight. Within 48 hours after the shooting death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri on August 9th, as violent unrest roiled the city's streets, Democratic Governor Jay Nixon requested that the Department of Justice open a federal criminal investigation. One official said would supplement rather than supplant the inquiry already being conducted by local authorities. Department of Justice has been dedicated resources to this, and um, we've been in touch with civil rights leaders, um, both in the area and, and nationally. Those resources would come to include over 40 FBI agents on the ground and a second autopsy of Michael Brown's corpse by a medical examiner from the Defense Department. Critics of the Obama administration and Attorney General Eric Holder in particular expressed doubt that DOJ would conduct an unbiased probe. Yeah, I just think so. it's a pity it's the federal government that should be responding. I mean, look, there... Why? Why is it a pity? Because I don't think this should be a federal issue, at least certainly not, not, not at this stage, uh, not, not at this stage of, of the investigation. We're not living in the year of, of segregation of, of Jim Crow. This is 2014. Who among us thinks that Eric, bringing Eric Holder's Department of Justice in is going to enhance the likelihood that we'll have an investigation that's impartial, objective, and professional? By August 20, with racial tension now a national flashpoint, Holder touched down in Ferguson himself. I understand what you're saying. Many citizens, local and beyond, applauded the Attorney General. We need some inspiration, and by him being here now, that's given us inspiration. Having the Attorney General of the United States involved in a shooting in Ferguson, Missouri, means that the family should get some reassurance, the police officers should get some reassurance, and the community should feel better that the federal government is taking a look well, into this seriously. But Holder widened DOJ 
involvement further, launching a so-called reform effort for the St. Louis County Police and opening still another federal probe into whether Ferguson police have exhibited a pattern or practice of unlawful conduct, one of 20 such probes of different police departments holders DOJ has initiated. That's more than twice as many as were opened in the previous five years. I think he wants to be known as having made a difference in terms of being sure that the justice system is viewed as fair to all Americans. I think it's really about optics. It's about this president wanting to show black America and his left that he is doing something here, uh, regardless of whether federal intervention is warranted at this point. With his own resignation already announced, Attorney General Holder has warned that none of the federal investigations he's ordered in Ferguson is being conducted according to any timeline, meaning they will likely come to a head under his successor. Brett. James, thank you. Now to the other big story of the day. Since President Obama's repudiation by the voters in the midterm elections, speculation has run rampant here in Washington on who would pay the price. Tonight, we know. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel is out. Officially a resignation, but U.S. officials are saying anonymously that he was fired. We have Fox team coverage on that tonight. Britt Hume here in the Bureau with what Hagel's departure means for the president. But we begin with Chief White House correspondent Ed Henry and a change at the top of the Pentagon. Good evening, Ed. Good evening, Brett. Everyone tried to put a happy face on this move today, but the administration insiders tell me and our own Jennifer Griffin at the Pentagon, make no mistake about it, this was a firing. I consider myself extraordinarily lucky to have had him by my side. President Obama went on for so long about Chuck Hagel's sterling credentials as defense secretary, he tried to push the idea the Republican had resigned on his own, though the word appropriate was a clue. Now, last month, Chuck came to me to discuss the final quarter of my presidency and determined that uh, having guided the department through this transition, it was an appropriate time for him to complete his service. Uh, let me just say that Chuck uh, is and has been a great friend of mine. Hagel went out of his way to say Vice President Biden was a dear friend and noted both the president and the secretary learned a lot from Biden. And even though top White House officials like Susan Rice and Dennis McDonough were there, Hagel pointedly left them out of his references to teamwork. I want to thank the entire leadership team at the Pentagon. Without their support and wise counsel over the last couple of years, uh, our many accomplishments, and the president uh, noted some, uh, I have been part of that, uh, but it's a team. Hagel had clashed with the White House, and insiders were not pleased by a memo to Rice suggesting Syria policy was failing because there was not enough focus on removing President Bashar al-Assad. Hagel was tired of micromanaging by White House aides, according to Republican John McCain, who said the secretary expressed deep frustration in a meeting last week. Already the White House people are leaking, well, he wasn't up to the job. I, believe me, he was up to the job. It was a job that he was given where he really was never really brought into that real tight circle inside the White House that makes all the decisions, which has put us into the incredible debacle that we're in today throughout the world. White House Press Secretary Josh Ernest ducked a direct question on whether Hagel was pushed out, but Ernest pushed back on McCain by noting he's a frequent critic and joked about a reporter suggestion the senator is close to Hagel. Yeah, I don't think that was on full display during his confirmation hearings, but <laughs> that's a reference to McCain and others pouncing on Hagel's disastrous performance at his confirmation hearing in January 2013 over Iran policy. You, I've just been handed a note that I uh, uh, misspoke and said I supported the president's position on containment. If I said that, it meant to say that I obviously, his position on containment, we don't have a position on containment. The tension only grew this summer when Hagel got far ahead of the president on Good ISIS. Afternoon. Oh, this is beyond anything that, that we've seen, so we must pre prepare for, for everything. His two predecessors, Robert Gates and Leon Panetta, both wrote books that were scathing about the president. Any concerns that Secretary Hagel was headed in that direction? Uh, no, I haven't seen any evidence of that. I, I think that you know one of the hallmarks of Secretary Hagel's career is he's somebody who's been been extraordinarily loyal uh, to his country and to his commander-in-chief. 
As for Hagel's successor, Democratic Senator Jack Reed has already pulled out of consideration, focused now on two Obama insiders who previously served at the Pentagon, Ash Carter and Michelle Flournoy. Flournoy would be the first female defense secretary ever, though, of course, any pick is first going to have to get through a new Republican Senate come January. Brett? Ed Henry, live on the North Lawn. Ed, thank you. Senior political analyst Britt Hume is here tonight with perspective on the Hagel ouster. Good evening, Britt. Hi, Britt. It barely matters if Chuck Hagel decided to step down on his own or was forced out. His departure leaves President Obama to clean up a mess of his own making. Hagel was almost no one's idea the best qualified person when he was appointed, which is why his fellow Republicans in the Senate nearly all voted against him. They suspected he was chosen by a president seeking a malleable Republican who wouldn't resist Mr. Obama's plans to further downsize the military and reduce this country's footprint in the world. After an embarrassingly inept performance in his confirmation hearing, he was approved by the smallest margin in the history of the job of defense secretary. This was never going to end well. But one of the ways it ended badly is a surprise. When the ISIS threat emerged, Hagel started telling the truth about it, as did senior military commanders under him. That put Hagel and his Joint Chiefs chairman at odds with the White House, which wanted to do something about ISIS, but not very much. Hagel, who was hired to represent the White House to the Pentagon, ended up doing the reverse, at least on ISIS. On that score, his tenure looks a bit like that of his predecessors, Bob Gates and Leon Panetta, who both advised President Obama against courses of action the president preferred, which now leaves president o for the president over for three in his quest for a pliant Secretary of Defense. Brett? What about that effort, you know, going forward? You have these names, Michelle Flournoy, Ash Carter, Jack Reed, you know, the next secretary to be. Well, Reed is out. The most obviously well qualified, I think, for that job would be Michelle Flournoy, who served as the undersecretary for policy in this administration under, under Gates and Panetta, and enjoys a considerable reputation as a defense intellectual and, and policymaker. I'm not sure the president will pick her. Uh, she'd be a great choice, uh, but she's strong and capable and will have her own set of views about what this country needs to be doing with its military establishment. Uh, that might not be what the president's looking for, but she would be quite a choice. Ash Carter, perhaps as well. Okay, Brett, thank you. Bet. This is a Fox News alert. We now know the Ferguson police shooting grand jury decision will be released at 9 p.m. Eastern time tonight. Stay with Fox News Channel for the latest developments. Up next, Republicans sniping at each other over a report on the Benghazi terror attacks. But first, here's what some of our Fox affiliates across the country are covering tonight. Fox 8 in Cleveland with the fatal police shooting of a 12-year-old boy. Authorities say Tamir Rice was carrying out, was carrying what turned out to be a replica gun with an orange safety indicator removed. The deputy chief says video shows the officer fired from less than 10 feet away. Fox 29 in Buffalo were fears of disastrous flooding from a rapid meltdown of the area's seven-foot snowfall are easing tonight. Minor to moderate flooding has been reported in several creeks, but nearby homes have largely been spared. Officials say the sewers in Buffalo and elsewhere are handling the runoff. And this is a live look at Los Angeles from our affiliate out there, Fox 11. They're covering fatal tour uh, bus crash near the Oregon border Sunday. Uh, the bus originated in Los Angeles. One man died. At least 31 others were hurt. The same bus was involved in another accident earlier in the day. Investigators say driver fatigue may have been a factor in both accidents. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back.